All right, so uh, I think that should give us most time to have most people join us. We know that some people will be coming on as we go. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Donna Turner. I'm an epidemiologist and the Provincial Director of Population Oncology at Cancer Care Manitoba, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of people who are interested in this presentation. In fact, uh, between uh, direct uh, sign up from Zoom and also Facebook Live, we are expecting over 500 participants. Welcome to you all. Uh, and this should be a very uh, exciting presentation. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation for supporting uh, the Cancer Prevention Initiative at Cancer Care Manitoba, and they are supporting uh, this, uh, this webinar. So um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 1 territory and that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. So now moving, thinking about webinar etiquette, uh, there's been a few questions already in the various uh, Q&A and chat boxes. Uh, so I'd like to just take care of a few webinar etiquette items. We are uh, recording this session and it will be available on Cancer, Canato Cancer Care Manitoba's website shortly after airing. The group uh, learning program has been certified by the College of Family Physicians of Canada and the Manitoba uh, chapter uh, for up to one main pro plus certified credits and the College of Family Physicians requires that you retain proof of your participation for six years in case you are selected to participate in credit validation or auditing. We are inviting you to ask questions uh, and we'll be addressing them in the last 15 to 25 minutes of the webinar. Uh, however, many of you have noted already that you are automatically muted. Uh, and so those uh, participating via Zoom can answer questions in the Q&A box. So not the chat box, but the Q&A box, please. Uh, those participating via Facebook uh, can type your questions in the comment box and we'll share them with the panelists. We did have some people participate or provide questions as they registered and thank you. Uh, that's given us a, a good uh, uh, idea as to where to start with our Q&A. Um, and also note that if we don't get to your questions because we do expect that there'll be a lot of interest in this topic, we will be collecting the questions and then putting the answers uh, up on our website along with the, uh, with the link afterwards. So uh, with that said, um, I, before we begin, I'd like to introduce Cancer Care Manitoba's president and CEO, Dr. Sri Navaratnam, who will provide introductory remarks. Dr. Navaratnam. I think uh, Dr. Navratnam, uh, you may have to unmute. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Turner. 40 to 50% of cancer cases can be prevented. Yes, 40 to 50% of cases could have been prevented. So today that each one of us have to think and reflect, what am I doing to reduce the cancer risk? How am I bringing awareness to our families, to our communities to reduce the cancer risk? So today it's a World Cancer Day. It had its beginnings in year 2000 from the World Summit Against Cancer in Paris. The goal of this World Cancer Day is to bring the global community together to work towards world free of cancer by promoting healthy lifestyle, bringing awareness, and also taking action by the organizations and the governments. And I'm very pleased to say today in Manitoba, the government of Manitoba proclaimed today as World Cancer Day. And World Cancer Day also promotes the equal access, so access to all for cancer services, regardless of who you are, where you live, where, which parts of the world you live in. We want to bring cancer service to everyone, which applies to Manitoba as well. There is no doubt that in the past year, we are so overwhelmed by COVID-19 pandemic, but we cannot forget cancer and we cannot forget our cancer patients. So on this World Cancer Day, 
I'm really inviting all of you to join us in bringing the awareness and taking action against cancer. Also this year, I'm very pleased to present this Roadmap to Cancer Control, Manitoba 2020. We have set six priorities, which is patient and community-centered care and research and innovation driven. These priorities call for action for best evidence-based high quality care to all Manitobans, regardless of where they live, which ethnicity belong, which religion or culture they have. The priority one on our road map to cancer control is prevention and screening. So it is very timely as we um, engage in our implementation of the roadmap, I'm very thankful to our guest speakers to address the talk, Cancer Prevention in Canada, what can we do? So thank you, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. As I said already, World Cancer Day is a very important day for us at Cancer Care Manitoba. In Canada, 600 Canadians are diagnosed every day with cancer, but the good news is almost 400 will be alive or will be cured with this cancer. So on this World Cancer Day, we also have to celebrate all of our successes that we had along the way, whether it is the cancer services, how we provide, or the research and innovation that brought new treatments so that people are living longer and people are living a good life with cancer. So on this important day at Cancer Care Manitoba, we like to pledge saying to Manitobans that we would bring high quality evidence-based care to all Manitobans. And I request the Manitobans to pledge that how would you reduce the cancer risk of you and the people around you? We cannot work alone together. We could fight this cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Navaratnam. So I would like to uh, introduce our speakers um, and just uh, to hear you see them uh, in, in slide. Uh, Dr. Christine Friedenreich holds a doctorate in epidemiology from the University of Toronto and completed postdoctoral training at the International Agency for Research on Cancer and the University of Calgary. She's a cancer epidemiologist who's been studying the role of physical activity in reducing cancer risk, improving rehab and survival after cancer diagnosis for nearly three decades. She has conducted over 40 observational epidemiologic and randomized controlled intervention trials in this area. She's the scientific director for the Department of Cancer Epidemiology and Prevention Research for Alberta Health Services, the division head and adjunct professor for preventive oncology, Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary, and an adjunct professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences and the Faculty of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary. She's also the interim scientific director for the O'Brien Institute of Public Health at the Cummings School of Medicine. Dr. Friedreich has many career awards from national and provincial health funding agencies, including the Canadian Cancer Society. Uh, she's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and was inducted as a fellow in the Royal Society of Canada in 2019. Her partner in this uh, presentation today is Dr. Darren Brenner, who is also a cancer epidemiologist with over a decade of experience conducting observational and intervention research on chronic disease and survival. He completed his PhD in epidemiology at the University of Toronto, followed by postdoctoral fellowships at the International Agency for Research on Cancer of the World Health Organization in Lyon in France. He then continued his postdoctoral training at, uh, uh, in Calgary at the Department of Cancer Epidemiology and Prevention with uh, Dr. Friedenreich. After this additional training, he's begun his career as a research scientist uh, in the Department of uh, Cancer Epidemiology and Preventive Research before transitioning to his current position at the University of Calgary as an assistant professor. Darren currently leads a program of research uh, in analytics to examine cancer risk and outcomes um, and, and uh, also uh, focuses on using big data and precision analytics. He was the co-lead of the Canadian Population Attributable Risk of Cancer, or COMPARE, project, a comprehensive set, set, comprehensive set of analyses examining the current and future burden of cancer in Canada related to all known modifiable risk factors. And we are going to hear something of that today. 
So Darren and Christine, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us today. And without further delay, we invite you to uh, share your work. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Donna. And I want to, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation and also for the foresight of Cancer Care Manitoba to put on this particular webinar on World Cancer Day, which is really uh, appropriate. So I'll start off with my presenter disclosure. Um, I receive grants from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Canadian Cancer Society, and I have no other disclosures regarding uh, honoraria or consulting fees. And I have no uh, potential mitigating uh, biases. And I have to disclose that I have received grants and research support from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Canadian Cancer Society, as well as research support from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and have received consulting fees from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. And I have uh, no concerns around mitigating potential bias and they're not applicable to this talk. So thank you very much, Darren. Uh, so uh, these are the learning objectives for today's presentation. We will try to identify the current and future burden of cancer incidence and mortality in Manitoba and Canada that could be prevented through lifestyle and environmental risk factors. We will also discuss um, how modifiable lifestyle and environmental risk factors can impact cancer risk. We'll look at the economic impact of risk reduction behavior, and we'll give you some illustrations on opportunities and how we might be able to impact public health policy and practice. We will also locate information on cancer prevention specific to Manitoba. So the outline for today's presentation is as follows. We will talk at first about what is cancer prevention. Then we will talk about what we know now and how do we know this and what can we do? So I'll just start off with this little uh, infographic here about what is cancer prevention to orient everyone. We essentially talk about three different levels of uh, cancer prevention. Primary prevention is really reducing the risk of actually ever developing cancer. This would be through things like um, mitigating your exposures to modifiable lifestyle factors, occupational and environmental uh, exposures. And then once cancer has begun uh, with that squiggly line that you see at the onset of cancer, uh, we then move into secondary prevention. So this is when we try to detect cancers before they have become clinically apparent uh, through screening programs like we have for breast, uh, colorectal um, and cervical cancers. And then finally, once uh, someone has been diagnosed with a cancer and they have been treated for that cancer, we talk about tertiary prevention, which is really trying to improve someone's survival after cancer through, again, often uh, changes in their lifestyle, as well, of course, all of, um, the treatments that we give these individuals. So here are some examples of successes that we've actually already had in cancer prevention. So these are data from um, the Canadian Cancer uh, Society, and we are sh showing how um, rates in tobacco uh, which, uh, and cigarette smoking, uh, and how these have been related to lung cancer in both men and women. And so what you can see in these graphs is that the incidence of um, lung cancer, which is the primary cancer associated with um, smoking and tobacco exposure, has been decreasing in both men and women. Um, it's been decreasing in a linear fashion, particularly in younger age groups in men, um, and also has, uh, we see this lovely decrease as well in women uh, in the younger age groups. It's much more dramatic um, in older age groups for men than it is for women. But this is a clear example of how since the 1950s, when we first started looking at the association between cigarette smoking and um, cancer, that we've been able to, through changes in policies, practice, and personal behaviors, uh, bring down the risks and the rates of uh, lung cancer. The next slide here shows another example of success, and this is with UV exposure and malignant melanoma. Uh, in between the 1960s and 1980s or so, when we did not really understand too much about how sun exposure was related to malignant melanoma risk, we saw increases in risks of these um, cancers in both men and women. But then we started some fairly uh, strong campaigns on sun safety um, and the slip slop and slap campaign so-called and where, where we saw some very nice decreases um, in the risks particularly amongst men and also um, in women uh, a plateauing of the uh, rates. And so you can see this amongst young people and older people as well. 
So what has actually been happening at a global level as far as synthesizing all of this information has been work by um, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, and also the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute of Cancer Research that have been doing ongoing syntheses of all of the evidence from observational and epidemiologic research studies on a number of different uh, carcinogens that could be potentially um, risk factors for cancer. The IARC has a monographs program and a handbooks program that have been instrumental in documenting all of the observational evidence that's happened and also some mechanistic evidence that has been clearly been able to delineate different levels of carcinogenicity for different risk factors. Um, and this has also been done by the WCRF more on uh, modifiable lifestyle factors. Their focus has been more on diet, uh, nutrition, physical activity, sedentary behavior, um, weight, and so on. And they have uh, also been documenting this on an ongoing basis. So these syntheses are very, very useful for agencies like Cancer Care Manitoba, and also for the research that we did in the COMPARE study, because they show us exactly uh, what the current evidence is from all the different uh, literature that's been conducted worldwide. Here is an example of the kind of syntheses that happen in um, these um, agencies. This particular graph shows us a force plot for the association between um, body mass index and risk of different cancer sites. And here you can see that there are a number of different cancer sites that have clearly been associated with um, an uh, increased risk for higher levels of obesity. So now uh, we'll be turning it over to my colleague Darren to talk about what we've been doing with the COMPARE study in conjunction with the Canadian Cancer Society. Thanks very much. Thank you, Christine. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. And it's nice to connect uh, through this virtual uh, and technology, allowing us to have these, these types of interactions. Um, so thank you, Christine, for setting the stage to let us know that we, we know that we can make an impact. We know that if we understand what drives cancer risk and drives incidence, we know that through the policy, through practice, and through personal change, like we saw for uh, lung cancer and melanoma, we can make a difference. And with all of those collaborative uh, panels and synthesis of evidence, we as a group, uh, we wanted to understand at the Canadian level what we could do in the future if we could have additional action at that policy, the practice, and the personal level. So we set off on what was called the Canadian Population Attributable Risk or the COMPARE project. And this was a project that was in close collaboration and partnership with the Canadian Cancer Society, where we took all of that synthesis of evidence, we added all kinds of additional Canadian specific data, and we were able to model out at a very detailed and granular level, the impact that modifiable environment, infection, and lifestyle behaviors have had on past cancer incidence trends, what the, the impact is right now. And most importantly, if we could implement some practice change, some policy change, and some personal behavioral change, what that would look like in the future in terms of could we bend that cancer curve? What could be that future impact on reducing the cancer impact in Canada? So, uh, this collaborative project we set out, we did all kinds of analysis, we put, we put lots of work and lots of methods together, and we were able to generate a, a multitude of, of these synthesis statistics. Uh, so this is just one high level example, and I would invite anyone who's interested to get additional information to go to our website at prevent.cancer.ca, where we have a collection of all of these results. Uh, and what we were able to do, as we mentioned, we were able to synthesize and estimate the numbers of, of cancer cases in Canada that presently are due to past exposures and also which we'll see in a minute in the future what we could do through some changes and through some prevention practices to reduce the impact of cancer in Canada. And so I'll just draw two particular uh, points on this uh, synthesis slide here. So we estimated that in 2015, about 70,000 cancer cases could have been prevented through reductions in exposure to all of these uh, risk factors. And again, these risk factors were selected based on the synthesis evidence that Christine uh, mentioned uh, at, at the start of the presentation. Uh, 
The other thing that I'll note is there are some things that we, uh, I would think, pretty widely understand as a, in society and as Canadians, you know, things like tobacco has a pretty profound impact. But even when you start going down the list, things like radon, air pollution, secondhand smoke, indoor tanning, these are still thousands of Canadians every year that have potentially preventable cancer cases. So even these sort of less well understood risk factors have a pretty profound impact on the cancer burden in Canada. And so that's the, the synthesis of, of, of how many cancers could be prevented. We also set off to understand at the cancer level. So what are some recommendations we could make for a prevention specific messaging for each cancer site? And so these again are two infographics that are available uh, through prevent.cancer.ca. And we have all kinds of interactive uh, data tools and, and and you are able to pull down all of our data. Everything is open access that you can pull down all the results for all the different cancer sites. But here, just to show that these are the second and third most common cancer sites among, uh, among women and then also among men for colorectal cancer. And what I'd just like to draw the, the point that this is a very large proportion of very common cancers that have a preventable or avoidable uh, a fraction of those cases that could be reduced in the future. Several of these things we can discuss later in the presentation, things like physical inactivity, uh, changes in body size, tobacco, secondhand smoke. We have some strategies that we could enact to help uh, at the policy, the practice, and the personal level to impact change um, going forward in Canada to reduce that cancer impact. So those um, statistics and those estimates were largely based on the current status of sort of what right now has happened and what's sort of led to that for those potentially preventable or attributable cancers. What we thought was perhaps even more important is what can we do in the future? What could some change and some action do in terms of uh, reducing that cancer burden? Or if I, I think back to that figure, bending that uh, cancer incidence curve down. And here we've taken uh, the numbers of attributable cancer cases. So you can think of this uh, attributable case as a preventable case. So it it's, uh, can be attributed to an exposure. So if you took that exposure away, you could prevent that case from happening in the future. And we wanted to give some different scenarios. So, so it would be very challenging to get everyone to change their behaviors or to enact policies that would happen completely um, and completely have complete population level effectiveness. So here we gave some, some different uh, scenarios around a modest, so small reductions, moderate, pretty uh, considerable reductions uh, in exposure to the population and aspirational would be a very strong change uh, in exposure, like a complete mitigation of radon in all homes would be a good example or complete vaccination of the population with HPV. But what we see is even at those modest, so those green bars, this is for the top 10 most common cancer sites that we looked at, you still have several thousand cancer cases uh, over time, uh, over the next 20 years that would not occur. So there's a clear benefit to even small pieces of action. So even a, a small benefit from a policy change, a practice change or a personal change will have an impact as we go forward into the future. Those are people, those are families that will not have to have those uh, cancer journeys that we could potentially avoid in the future. And again, we have all of these data. Uh, if you wanna go by site by site or exposure by exposure, they're all openly available through prevent.cancer.ca. And I would invite anyone, if they're interested, to go have a look. So that's looking at all of the exposures together. We are also interested at in looking uh, at individual exposures so we could kind of rank them in terms of potential return on the investment or uh, potential benefit for changes in exposure. And so again, that was the synthesis of multiple risk factors. We also here at prevent.cancer.ca have uh, detailed information for each of those exposures that we are interested in here. And this gives you a little bit more of an understanding about what we meant by a modest, a moderate, and an aspirational uh, prevention goal. So here this is, so years are on the bottom and these are um, cumulative preventable cases. So cases that if we reduce the exposure uh, would not occur going forward into the future. And again, these are modeled out to over 20 years to 2042. So the red line is what we would call our modest, the black line is what we call our moderate and the green, the, sorry, the blue line would be our aspirational. So this would be a 10% reduction, a 25% reduction or a 50% reduction in 
uh, UVR risk behavior. So that includes indoor tanning, not using the sunscreen and having excessive sunburns over time. And what you can see is that even the modest, the so lowest, the 10% reduction in those behaviors over time adds up to thousands of Canadians and thousands of cancer diagnoses that could potentially be avoided. And again, these are all uh, available on our website and you can work with the dashboards and, and customize the visualizations however you would like. So we understand that there is something we can do. We worked in the compare project to model what we could do if we could go forward. But we also wanted to sort of generate a bit more discussion and, and try to prove the point that it's not going to be easy to do. It's going to take investment in terms of finances and time at the policy, at the practice, and at the personal level. So we wanted to help with some of that messaging to understand what could be that potential cost savings. So when we understand that if we make those investments, we could actually save money in the end. And so what we did here, and this was work that was led by Yubing Ruan and Abby Poirier in our group, where we work with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer uh, to integrate the compare results into what is called the OncoSim framework. And so what the OncoSim framework does is it provides a modeling framework to evaluate the cost effectiveness or the cost savings of a potential treatment screening or prevention program. And we have now integrated all of these results into that modeling framework. It's also open access and anyone can get a user account to do this. Uh, but to just give you the summary, it's a lot of money that could be saved. So we did this on an exposure by exposure. We could also do it from a savings per cancer site if we wanted to. But here you see these are in billions of Canadian dollars. So we assume that there'd be a 10 year period where you wouldn't see a change in those cancer rates because it takes a while for change to happen at the exposure and then change to happen at the cancer level. So between 2032 and 2044, allowing for that, that period for cancer uh, to occur and for the change in exposure to happen, we would be talking about tens of billions of dollars in, in direct cancer treatment costs. So the cost for surgical, ra uh, surgical uh, radiation and medical oncology, as well as diagnosis and, and ongoing care. Um, and so when we look at across these exposures, uh, several of them like excess body size, physical inactivity uh, are sort of uh, exposures that if we could have changes in the population level, they would also have additional cost savings in that they would likely benefit other chronic diseases, but also several exposures like H. pylori, different infections that would have a specific cancer benefit. So there's a very um, measurable benefit to action for all of these exposures. So the sort of take home message here is that there's a potential uh, a, a strong potential for cost savings and cost effectiveness through cancer prevention strategies. Again, just showing this, um, that was sort of a synthesis and how do those, how are those data generated? Uh, this is for just looking specifically at excess body size and again, showing our modest, moderate and aspirational uh, prevention targets with 10, 25 and 50% reduction. Here on the left, these are annual costs. And on the right, these are if you accumulate them over time. And so you can quickly see how these annual costs turn into billions of cumulative cost over time. So again, uh, there's also an economic argument to be made for cancer prevention. So that was a very high level summary of our understanding of, yes, we can do something. What could we do? And is there an ar economic argument for what we could do? So I just wanted to sort of tie tie this up with how we actually did this uh, sort of that we weren't just uh, making things up and using assumptions. There's lots of actual Canadian specific data that went into this work. And so just to say that we uh, were able to, thankfully we in Canada, we have excellent cancer registry. So we're able to get very granular data in terms of cancer incidence and mortality. Uh, we were able to get some risk estimates for each of these exposures borrowing heavily from those international collaborative and synthesis panels that Christine mentioned at the start. And also we're very fortunate through Statistics Canada and several other agencies where we have very detailed measures of how common these exposures are in the Canadian population. So for all of those different risk factors and different uh, environmental and infectious exposures, 
were able to come up with very granular age and, uh, and sex specific um, exposure prevalence estimates. So we put all of this together in a framework called the population attributable risk or the population attributable fraction. And using that with a uh, combination with the Canadian Cancer Registry, we're able to come up with uh, some measures of these excess uh, attributable cases or the case in this case, what could we do, they would become potentially preventable cancers moving forward into the future. Uh, and then just on that economic side, what were you able to do when we co uh, combined the compare data with the CPAC Oncosyn data? Uh, this is a very complex diagram, but just to say these models existed and they didn't actually incorporate the, these risk factors, these potential uh, prevention uh, uh, intervention scenarios. And we have now, as part of our commitment to make sure our research is openly available, both in terms of the results and then the future expanded usability, uh, this has now been integrated working with uh, the partnership against cancer that now this, these tools are, are, more, are more broadly available and allow us to model these detailed measures of preventable incidence, preventable mortality and cost savings. So we can evaluate some of those potential cost savings uh, uh, in terms of investment in uh, cancer prevention at the policy practice and personal level. And just very briefly to mention some of the limitations of this work. Uh, again, we did our best to uh, know that our, our risk estimates and our exposure estimates were reflective of the Canadian population. In some cases that wasn't possible, but we tried to rely on the closest representative uh, data samples from North America. Uh, for the economic work, we weren't able to model the combination of joint exposures. So in some cases, uh, some of these risk factors would uh, be related with each other and they might have uh, additional uh, benefit across different, uh, different cancer sites and different diseases. Uh, and so that wasn't able to be accounted for. And in the Oncosim model, it only uh, models the, the direct cancer management costs. So what we showed in those graphs are just the direct cancer treatment costs. They don't incorporate the very real costs of the indirect cost to the patient and family in terms of the, the consequences of cancer diagnoses. So we know we can do something. We know we could do something. We know that there is a, an argument that we should do something economically. So what can we do? And so again, this is another one of our summary graphics that can be found at prevent.cancer.ca. And it shows that taken collectively, there's lots that can be done. Each of these exposures have some known intervention uh, at the population or the practice or the policy level that we can start to act on. We'll just mention very briefly before we wrap up a few specific examples um, and then we'll open up for questions. So using the example of HPV. So here we see that HPV um, is accountable for about four percent of all attributable cancers in Canada or all preventable cancers. HPV is actually related to multiple cancers, but we know that of, of the HPV related cancers, 35% uh, of them are cervical cancers. We know that HPV causes all or nearly all cases of cervical cancer. There's been an amazing amount of research that was conducted and really led by many Canadian researchers that have helped pave the way to understand the etiology, the, the causal um, pathways for HPV leading to cervical cancer, uh, to develop the vaccines, and now we have population-based vaccine programs. So what can we do? Again, we know that this HPV causes more than six different cancer sites. And we know that every year about 4,000 cancer cases are due to HPV. But what can we do if we could increase the uh, rates of Canadian children being vaccinated through school programs? By 2042, we would be able to prevent over 5,000 cancer cases from happening. And these would happen, uh, these are, are, are cases that would occur at younger ages among women as they go uh, from the, the, to become in the eligible risk categories as they get older. So these are very real diagnoses that could be prevented through the increased uptake and adherence to, to school-based HPV vaccination programs. There's many other things we can do. We know from the policy level that uh, things like taxation has a really strong effect. It seems to be the most effective tool in reducing tobacco uh, cessation or to tobacco initiation and, and uh, 
reducing the, the volume of tobacco consumed in the population. We know at the personal level, we can uh, be sun safe. I would urge everyone to have a look at the Canadian Cancer Society as well as Cancer Care Manitoba and their prevention materials to, to be sun safe and recommendations for all those behaviors. Uh, there's also things we can do in our homes and the where we live in our workplaces, things like having our houses radon tested and mitigated. These are uh, sort of one-time things that uh, are, are relatively straightforward and that we can intervene at one given time point and our, where our risk drops off precipitously over time. And then of course, there's uh, organized population-based cancer screening programs, uh, such as for colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and cervical cancer. And we know that if these diseases are caught at an earlier stage, survival is much improved 90% versus at a later stage, such as stage four, where survival is at less than 15%. So screening is crucial in addition to all these additional prevention uh, aspects that we can be proactive in our cancer prevention journeys. Um, as a group of researchers, we are working with other stakeholders like the Partnership Against Cancer, like the CCS to uh, take these research into action, into policy documents, into recommendations to government to help facilitate those policy changes that can most affect uh, cancer and the population. So in summary, uh, we can do many things. We can reduce uh, cancer incidence in Canada through a combination of policy, practice, and personal change. Our results suggest that somewhere between 10 and 40,000 cases per year could be prevented in Canada by 2042. And I've shown some examples of those particular cancer sites and exposures that uh, could be prevented. Subsequently, we can reduce mortality. We've also modeled out, we did not show it here, but it's also available. Uh, that the impact of these risk factors also has not just on cancer incidence, but also on, on subsequent cancer mortality. And we've also been able to show that prevention can save money, where we know that many of these uh, risk factors will lead to the direct treatment cost of, of in excess of $10 billion over the next 20 years. So we definitely know that we can do something, we should do something, and it can save money in the end. So with that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Turner and open up for the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Drs. Brenner and Friedenreich. Uh, lots to think about here, and uh, certainly many people have been uh, asking us questions as we've been going. Uh, so again, encourage people to use the Q&A chat box um, uh, if you're in Zoom, and then to add your questions in um, uh, in the Facebook Live. Uh, and uh, so we've had um, some questions that people sent in before, as well as some that, that are um, coming in as we are, as we've been speaking. So um, I'm going to start uh, with a question uh, about um, uh, exercise and specifically what type of exercise matters for reduction of cancer risk, duration, intensity, and so on. Uh, Dr. Friedenreich, I know you do a lot in this area. Maybe you can comment. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Donna, for that opportunity to respond to that first question. So first of all, I want to clarify that it's all types of physical activity that we talk about, not just exercise, that have been shown to be associated with a reduction in risk of cancer. Uh, to date, we have about 13 different cancer sites uh, where we have shown that if people are more physically active, uh, be it recreationally, occupationally, or in their household uh, uh, activities, that they have a reduced risk of developing cancer. And with respect to the question about, you know, what is the optimal frequency, intensity, duration of activity, uh, this uh, work has been looked at very extensively uh, by most recently the World Health Organization. They've just come up with guidelines in uh, 2020 on physical activity and sedentary behavior. And the recommendations along with what came out from the US um, in 2018 on, with the physical activity guidelines for Americans is to aim for 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity. So moderate intensity activity would be something like brisk walking, something that uh, you know slightly brings your heart rate up, uh, doesn't cause you to sweat uh, like all uh, you know, intense activity uh, is already been shown to be beneficial for reducing a lot of chronic diseases, but is also uh, the recommendation for cancer prevention. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, there's been a, some follow on questions that have been coming in uh, that actually pull uh, uh, refer to something around. So in the compare study, uh, there's been a discussion around um, uh, the different, you know, different, there's physical inactivity that that it puts you at increased risk. And then there's sedentary lifestyle. And they're in two separate buckets in the in the graphic that shows that shows the analysis. Can you comment about how did the study differentiate the difference between physical inactivity and sedentary lifestyle? And how are these defined? Yes, so we use something called a metabolic equivalent of task METS to define how much energy people actually expend when they are uh, active. If you are sitting, uh, you would be doing something at a MET level below 1.5. So that's considered sedentary behavior. Um, if you're doing any kind of standing or moving around, then you're generally expending more than 1.5 METs and that would be considered physical activity. Uh, so we have light, moderate and vigorous physical activity. And, and so re lots of research studies have now been done where they've actually been able to differentiate and specifically measure sedentary behavior distinct from physical activity. Um, so if you are physically inactive, that generally would mean that you're not doing very much sort of um, activity that's standing and walking around any kind of walking, that sort of thing. If you are um, uh, focusing on sedentary behavior, it'd be any kind of activity that you're doing, like uh, sitting at a desk, uh, you know, sitting, watching television, um, any type of uh, activity that's done at home uh, that's actually based in sitting. So it's, it's basically sedentary behavior is kind of synonymous with sitting um, and uh, physical activity is anything that's done standing or more. And so we were definitely able to uh, differentiate that in the COMPARE study because uh, there have been now quite a number of studies that have specifically uh, measured sedentary behavior distinct from physical activity. And what's really important is that we found that sedentary behavior in and of itself is a risk factor for several cancers. And so now a lot of our campaigns and, and the WHO was very good about this in their most recent guidelines, they specifically addressed sedentary behavior distinctly from um, physical uh, inactivity. And basically we're suggesting that people try to sit less and move more. Thank you very much. That's that's helpful to, to have that distinction. I think you know it's a it jumps to people's mind when they see they think, well, are you double counting? Uh, so uh, just for folks who are adding questions to the to the Q and A, uh, thank you. Please continue to do that. Just a note um, that we are just the volume that's been coming in. We're not going to get to all of them, but just remember we will uh, reply to your questions uh, in uh, in the website or on the website afterwards. Um, there's been um, some questions up around um, nutrition and in particular, uh, starting with um, the, uh, there, so uh, Darren, you were mentioning about um, the uh, idea of policy changes and so taxation, for example, in, um, uh, in smoking has, has, taxation on tobacco has contributed to the drop in tobacco and therefore the decline in, in uh, cancers associated with, the, with uh, smoking. So what about taxing sugary beverages? Should that be pursued? Thank you for the question. I think it's a it's a very interesting discussion point. Uh, it has been pursued in a few um, municipalities in the United States. And so I think there will be some data to come in the next few years in terms of whether the taxation worked to reduce consumption. And then I think if we can have that evidence to say that, yes, this, uh, you know, helping hand at the policy level did in fact lead to reduced consumption at the individual level, then I think it's something that should be very much put on the table. Uh, but I think that those types of uh, evaluations need to be performed before uh, we can just go straight to the policy level. I think personally, I think it's a very interesting potential proposal and way to reduce uh, sugar consumption at the population level. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll see, uh, time will tell what the results of those, uh, those sort of tests are. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, there's been a couple of questions around prostate cancer. And I wonder if either one of you could comment on where does prostate cancer fit into the big picture in your analysis? I'm not quite sure what you mean by the big picture. Uh, we certainly uh, included prostate cancer because it is such a um, common cancer in Canada in all of our analyses. What we did find uh, was that as far as modifiable risk factors were concerned, 
uh, only about 4% of uh, prostate cancers in Canada in 2015 could be prevented. And that's simply because um, there aren't that many modifiable risk factors for prostate cancer. Uh, we know that, um, you know, excess weight is somewhat associated with prostate cancer, but a lot of the risk factors for prostate cancer are actually non-modifiable. These, these are things like age, race, family history, um, you know, things that essentially that we can't change. So thank you for that. And, and certainly there is a long way to go with prostate cancer. You look, as you say, only 4% compared to some of the other cancers where there's um, clearly a lot more known in that, that age group. Uh, or that uh, particular site. Um, so there was a, a, a question um, also related to obesity. Um, and there, first of all, a comment from one of our participants saying, I, I guess um, we have to be cautious about saying that losing weight is, is an easy solution. I, I don't think it is. And certainly there's a lot of things that have to be uh, considered. But could, can you talk a little bit about what specific cancers are related to obesity and in, in, uh, that you found through your research? For sure. Um, and this is actually was one of the interesting findings that we had from the compare study uh, is that we did f uh, find that um, obesity was actually or excess weight, we called it was actually it, it responsible for about 4% of all cancer cases in Canada. Uh, we, the, the two cancers that are most strongly associated with excess weight are esophageal uh, adenocarcinoma and endometrial cancers. But excess weight is also uh, increasing the risk of colorectal cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, stomach cancer, ovarian cancer, liver cancer, head and neck cancers, and pancreatic cancer. So you can see it's actually uh, quite an important um, risk factor. And we estimated that in 2015, there were about 7,200 new cancer cases that were due to excess weight. And that number could nearly triple uh, to, to over 21,000 uh, in 2042 if the current trends um, persist. So if we were able to get Canadians to have a, a healthy body weight, then uh, over 110,000 ca cancer cases could be prevented by 2042. So uh, this was actually quite a remarkable uh, finding and it put uh, excess body weight right after tobacco as one of the most important factors that we need to intervene on. We certainly recognize that um, obesity has a multifactorial etiology and that um, changing levels of excess weight uh, at a population level require a multiple pronged approaches uh, to, to be able to make those changes. But that is something that we should seriously be looking at because the benefits are potentially large, not just for cancer, but for a lot of other non-communicable diseases as well. All right, thank you. And so we've talked um, a bit about, um, like, so now obesity, physical activity, we've talked about a um, little bit about um, sugar sweetened beverages, but there's also some uh, interesting questions coming in about that are in the nutrition uh, area. And um, just a it, it was interesting to see uh, that low fruits are more of a risk compared to low vegetables. Uh, and can you explain why the difference uh, between the two? Um, so essentially what we found was that both um, a low fruit and uh, well but essentially that both fruit and vegetable intake are important for reducing uh, the risk of cancer and if you look at the World Cancer Research Fund report um, they are actually do have recommendations for increasing um, both uh, fruit and vegetable intake so low fruit and veg intake is associated with lung cancer um, breast cancer, it's, it's low fruit. For colorectal cancer, bladder cancer. For head and neck cancer, it's a low vegetable intake. Pancreatic cancer, stomach cancer, it's low fruit. And ovarian cancer is low vegetable. And esophageal cancers and liver cancers. Um, so again, a number of cancers here that are associated with them. Um, I'm not sure, Darren, if you want to add anything about the difference between fruit and vegetable intake, but it's, you know, they're both very important because we know that dietary fiber is also associated with a lot of um, cancer sites, uh, particularly um, whole grains, you know, are associated with decreased risk of colorectal cancers. And so I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about the difference between fruit and vegetable intake. Darren, did you want to say anything? Sure. Just to say, just to echo that they're both important. Um, the hypothesis for some of the fruit intake 
is that it has particular micronutrients that are particularly um, antioxidant in nature or have particular chemical properties that are uh, beneficial. Whereas uh, a large consumption of fibrous vegetables is really focused on the protective uh, for colorectal cancer. Uh, and then that's sort of where the evidence sits right now. And that, that may change over time with additional studies, but the, the real take home message is they're both important. And there's just slight differences in, in the understanding of the, the biological associations underpinning the, these uh, observations. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, there's there's also, um, uh, uh, there, again, questions are coming in, great questions from the audience. Thank you all so much. We, and we will be um, uh, addressing those as we go. Um, I'd like to just uh, switch into, uh, we'll just say a few closing comments. If we have time for one quick question at the end of that, we can we can do that. But I, I want to start by uh, thanking uh, Darren and Christine for sharing their work uh, with us um, and making uh, making things um, bringing giving us a lot to think about here in, in Manitoba. So um, if we could go to that next slide, Darren, I think. So one of the things just that folks would be interested to know is that in the work that was done by Darren and Christine and their team in the COMPARE project, they didn't just look at what was happening in Canada, but we actually looked at what was happening or got the data from what's happening in Manitoba. And so again, um, I really encourage folks to have a look at this uh, this work. And, and you can see that uh, about four in, can, in 10 cancer cases can be prevented through healthy living and policies that would protect the health of Manitobans. Tobacco remains number one, but the physical inactivity uh, is number two and the low fruit uh, number three. Uh, but really, you guys, again, if we look at, the, at some of these things uh, in general, I think there's there's a lot of things uh, that we can look at. So really encourage folks to, to have a look at, at uh, that. Um, now, what are we doing in Manitoba uh, as Cancer Care Manitoba? Well, uh, Cancer Care Manitoba is working on um, really uh, refining and articulating the cancer prevention strategy. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, which is going to uh, give you more information. And this is a bit of a graphic just to prompt you and provide that website uh, there. Uh, note, as Dr. Navaratnam uh, pointed out at the beginning, that prevention and screening are a uh, priority uh, number one, uh, out of, uh, we have six priorities uh, in our new roadmap uh, to cancer control for Manitoba. And so uh, we really are going to be investing a lot in this. And again, with much many thanks to the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation, which has been a great funding partner in many of these, but we'll be working with many other stakeholders uh, too. Uh, this is not something that uh, we'll be able to uh, go alone uh, in this. And we'll be looking at partners uh, in that one. So. If we go to the next slide, uh, what should we do to prevent cancer in Manitoba? Well, you can help us, uh, those of you that are on the slide. Actually, back one, Darren, thanks. Uh, the, the survey, there's a survey. We're asking people to tell us what they're interested in about cancer prevention, what they know, what they don't know. So I would really encourage you to go to the uh, uh, www.preventcancermb.ca uh, and uh, have a look there at the survey. Uh, we would love to get additional voices uh, to help us uh, identify what are, where are we going to start? There's a lot of for us to tackle. So uh, where, what are you most interested in? So uh, let us know. You also may be interested in becoming a public advisor. And uh, we're looking for a, a group to volunteer to be an advisory panel. Uh, you can see there's a, a website there, screening at cancercare.mb.ca. Please, uh, would encourage you to uh, 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 email our team and uh, if you're interested and they will get back to you uh, shortly. So with that, I'm just going to the next one. Uh, just note that uh, there is uh, an evaluation that you will be receiving. And for those of you that um, uh, would uh, will be needing a certificate of participation for those uh, main pro press main pro plus credits and so on uh, that you just you'll receive that um, and so also note that uh, our webinar uh, will be will be posting it online uh, in uh, the next few days we will tackle all the questions that came in and produce a companion document uh, to go along with this um, so I do want to again thank everybody for their participation uh, in this regard, um, and uh, thank you for to uh, uh, 
Darren and Christine for sharing. Thank you for Dr. Navaratnam for your opening words and continuing support in this area to the Cancer Care Manitoba Foundation for their um, support of this work. Uh, and to the whole team uh, here at Cancer Care who's been uh, helping to put this on. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, audience. Uh, we would not uh, be here without you. Um, we look forward to working with you in the near future. Uh, and uh, so stay tuned, uh, check out our website, check out the webinar, and we will uh, follow up those questions. Thank you again, and wishing you a good afternoon.